Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Health Channel, all health, all the time. I'm Andrew Schmartz. Joining us this hour is Dr. Michael Swartzen, who specializes in sports medicine and is a team doctor with the Miami Dolphins. And here in Miami, he sure sees a lot of injuries from tennis and golf. We'll start with an injury known as shoulder tendonitis. It's common in tennis and baseball, swimming, and even on the Supreme Court because Justice Sonia Sotomayor is about to have shoulder surgery. Before we talk to the doctor, we have this story. Most common shoulder injuries in tennis players are either cartilage tears or more commonly tendonitis and bursitis of the rotator cuff tendon, sometimes associated with a tear. The symptoms of a rotator cuff tear are usually a combination of weakness, pain with certain motions, particularly such as the surface motion or reaching across the body, and a distinctive characteristic is pain at night when trying to sleep. So, Doctor, many of us consider ourselves at one time or another some sort of athlete, whether we were any good or not. I have a broken leg and a broken foot at one point and, and a few other broken bones. First, let's begin with the general kind of concept that even when you're an amateur athlete and a weekend warrior playing golf or tennis, you are susceptible to injuries, and a lot of people don't recognize that. Anyone can get injured at any time. Really, a combination of factors is usually what ends up causing the injury. So Dr. Selznick uh, in the previous video, um, he's one of our orthopedic surgeons at the Miami Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Institute. What we try and do is diagnose the injuries that you come in with, but also try, <clears throat> try and prevent things from happening again. So the minute you have an injury, that's the number one risk factor for you having the injury again. And so you need to be very careful. If you've ever had shoulder tendonitis before, you really should concentrate on strengthening your shoulder before you try and do an activity. And most of the injuries you see are repetitive injuries and not necessarily traumatic injuries. Correct. Um, generally, I, I see a, a good mix of both. Uh, I would say overuse are the most common injury that I see. Everyone likes to to be active. This is South Florida. We generally have very good weather. People like playing sports like tennis outside. Um, and even the older adults that had knee problems are now playing pickleball, which is a variation of tennis that you don't have to move as much. But it still involves using uh, your overhead throwing motion with the racket. Yeah, and we're, we're talking about shoulder tendonitis. It's a combination of overuse and misuse sometimes in the way people are serving and the way people are performing the sport? There's so many factors at play. Um, equipment, mm -hmm. right? Maybe your, your racket is too heavy or the strings aren't at the right pressure. Um, you have your form. Of course, if you're trying out a, a two-handed backhand and you've always had a one-handed backhand, that could all of a sudden cause you to have an injury. Uh, and if you decide to compete in a game where you're serving more often or more overhead uh, volleys, that's going to increase your chances of having something like tendonitis of the shoulder. Uh, and before we get into the specifics of tendonitis, generally speaking, you do not necessarily feel injured until the next day, right? So you're, you're playing a sport and everything seems fine. By, de <clears throat> by definition, tendonitis is a, an inflammatory process, which means that sometimes it takes a few hours to even a couple days for that process to take hold. Once that inflammation happens, that's when you'll start to feel the pain, whether it's uh, when you go to put your seatbelt on, when you go to, if you're a woman, to, to hook your bra, if you're going to grab something overhead, that's when you'll start to feel it. And you may not even at the time relate it back to playing tennis that weekend. Okay, we have an animation that you can walk us through a little bit of how tendonitis develops in the shoulder. 
We can take a look at our tennis player here. So here's he's had, he's had a rough match. So here's our <laughs> tennis player. Um, it it really shows a lot of the motion, right? The shoulder is a wonderful joint that allows you to have movement forward, out, back, and different variations with the rotation. So everything moves around. The important thing to look at is actually this model doesn't show the rotator cuff muscles. It shows some of the other muscles involved like the deltoid and the neck muscles. So a lot of times you may feel shoulder pain but you may also have neck pain and a lot of that is because all of this is related. Everything in the shoulder girdle from the collarbone and the shoulder blade to your arm bone, all of it work together in order to move your shoulder properly to give you that advantage. You can see if, if you go all the way back and swing forward like in tennis over and over and over again this that whole area can get uh, abused. We hear uh, pitchers obviously in the major leagues suffer from rotator cuff problems. Mm -hmm. Can you show us a little bit about where that is and how that occurs? So underneath this area and in front of your shoulder blade and behind your shoulder blade there's four muscles and tendons that control a majority of the movement of the shoulder whether you're going out whether you're going back whether you're going to the side or forward they all work sometimes alone and sometimes in unison to try and, and get you to perform that activity so when you're using that one muscle or tendon over and over again, you're asking it to do more necessarily than it's capable of doing. Which is not to say that you can never do that, it's just a fu function of your training, your fitness level, what, what demands can you take. And with an injury like this and a repetitive injury, is that a big factor of training, fitness, being prepared? Because you're only playing tennis maybe once a week or every other week. If, if you're an amateur player playing for fun, it's certainly very easy to get the adrenaline going and if there's a competition between you and friends or, or business colleagues or family, you, you get very involved and so a lot of times your, your brain will move past any pain and you won't think about maybe I've played too much today. And how often do these injuries end up in the emergency room? It sounds like this is, a, a, this is more of a, I have a nagging pain, I better see a doctor. Most of the time we'll, we'll see patients that have had this for weeks to months and it's just gone on too long. Um, when we're really young, uh, our body can take a lot more of the abuse. And so when you're young and you rest for a day or two, a lot of times the pain goes away. Uh, when you're older, sometimes it lingers a little bit. Some people might try some rest or ice or, or um, something like Advil or Aleve, an over-the-counter anti-inflammatory. And when the pain persists, it, it is I ideal to see a physician. Um, generally, people don't go to the emergency department or urgent care for, for shoulder tendonitis. It, it can happen depending on, on the hours, but there, there are other options. What um, ways of avoiding this injury do you recommend and exercises maybe to help prevent it? Really, um, if you've had an injury before or you currently have something like shoulder tendonitis, your best bet would be physical therapy. There's specific hmm. exercises to isolate the damaged area uh, and retrain it and sometimes that requires things like bands tied to doorknobs. If you've never had an injury, then all I would say is start out with any new activity very carefully, think about things before you do them, and give yourself a chance to recover. So if you play tennis and you're worried you overdid it, like you said, give yourself a few days to recover instead of going and playing the very next day. Do, do, does ice help or do you want to heat 
you know, put a heating pad on it because a lot of times people get home and feel a little sore and, you know, self, self treat it with, uh, with, as you mentioned, some aspirin or Advil or an anti-inflammatory, but also with maybe ice or heating pad, you know, which one is the better one? <laughs> so that's a, that's an age old debate, whether ice or heat is better. Generally, if you're in pain after an injury or after some use, ice would be the preferred option you should put it on for about 15 to 20 minutes two to three times a day um, ice can burn so mm -hmm. do be careful when you use it uh, heat does have a role especially prior to trying to use the shoulder again so if you wanted to warm up the shoulder literally uh, a heating pad would be a good idea okay now Doctor, when we come back, we'll learn more about shoulder injuries and one other sport that is more at risk for this type of injury. We'll be right back here on the Health Channel. Check out our website, allhealthallthetime.com. T-cell therapy is a revolutionary new treatment for cancer. Healthcare companies developing CAR T immunotherapy use Thermo Fisher's Dynabeads technology to isolate, activate, and expand T cells that have been genetically engineered to recognize and fight cancer cells. We're taking the patient's own cells and enriching those cells to fight the cancer. For more, go to thermofisher.com slash CTS. In the past 50 years, we've made a lot of progress in smoking prevention. But if we don't do more, one out of every 13 children alive today will die early from smoking. That's 5.6 million precious lives we can save. Together, we can make the next generation tobacco free. Is thinking about taking a dietary supplement. She knows she should try to get her vitamins and minerals from the food she eats, but she doesn't always have the chance to eat right. And with more than 50,000 dietary supplements on the market, like a lot of other people, Emily has questions. Like how much vitamin A is good for you and how much is too much? If something's natural, doesn't it mean it's safe? Can folic acid prevent birth defects? Should we be taking calcium and vitamin D supplements? Luckily, there's a place everyone can go for answers. It's the website of the Office of Dietary Supplements. We're part of the National Institutes of Health, and since 1995, we've been conducting, funding, and evaluating research that we use to educate the public, giving Emily plenty of information she can share and discuss with her health care providers. We're ODS for what you need to know about dietary supplements. Welcome back to the Health Channel, all health all the time. We're talking about sports injuries. We covered a little bit of tennis earlier. We're gonna talk about golf now and an injury called bursitis. I'm not a golfer, so I sometimes wonder how you get injured on the golf course, even though we saw that on the, I think the PGA, where a golfer dislocated his ankle and then continued to play. Uh, uh, <laughs> Most of us can't do that. <laughs> no, that, that was a horrific injury. Horrific injury. I, uh, um, I can't believe he was able to do that. Um, it's uh, a true testament to 
someone continuing to compete, I would not recommend anyone out there do that. I'd recommend going to seek uh, medical, medical help attention. Yeah. right away. And I think most people would have to because they'd be on the ground seething in pain. Yeah. We're not professional athletes. Okay, so bursitis, how does this occur for a golfer? So we have bursas all throughout our body. Bursas, and what is a bursas? So uh, a bursa is basically a, a thin sac, um, and if you uh, are looking at this video, um, you can see here in the white, uh, you can see the bursa. Generally, it is very, very thin, like uh, a couple sheets of paper. But when angered, and that can be from a direct impact or from overuse, like it would be in golf, um, it does swell. And so this picture does a very good job. If you see the red here, that's your supraspinatus tendon. That's one of your rotator cuffs. Mm -hmm. So when you lift your arm up, everything gets pushed closer to this bone. And when you see, when the bursa is getting swollen, you don't have a lot of space which is why people that get bursitis typically try and raise their arm and they have pain. This is exactly and that's, why. And that's because the bones are grinding on each other? Because the bone is pinching on the bursa and the bursa and the tendons do have uh, nerves on them to let you know that they're injured. Mm -hmm. And so in a way the bursa is a good mechanism for us to, to know there's something wrong. There's bursas all throughout the body. You know, the, the knee has, you know, four or five different bursas. The hip have different bursas. And so they're all um, made for us to allow for smooth movement, right? It's like a buffer. So in this case, um, if you look back here, if this bursa were not here, this tendon would be rubbing right up against this bone, and that may not be ideal. So instead, we have this bursa, which is normally very, very thin and allows for smooth movement. But in cases where uh, you're overusing it, you're going to the driving range and you're trying to really perfect your game. Um, again, back to tennis, same so, thing. Same thing. So, so explain, so in golf, what is the motion that sort of causes this? It's the over... The swinging of the shoulders. It's the, it's the big swings. Um, generally, you can get these type of problems with golf. I mean, golfers can get injuries anywhere from their, their fingers all the way up to their neck because it's all connected through a kinetic chain. And so depending on which load or what kind of work you're asking your shoulder to do, that's what you end up the problem. How do, how do you diagnose this when someone walks into your office? Um, you know, the video earlier uh, showed Dr. Selznick examining uh, a young man's shoulder. We look at it. Um, are there any deformities? Do we see any bruising? Okay, we, we ask you to point to us where you have your pain so we have some idea of where it hurts because sometimes it directly relates to where your problem is and sometimes pain is referred, so we just use it as a guide. Uh, and then we'll, we'll have you move your shoulder around and based on what limitations you have, we may be able to diagnose something. And luckily, we have another shoulder on the other side <laughs> that we can use to check what your normal is. After we do the range of motion, we check your muscles. Mm -hmm. Because if you have something more severe, like a rotator cuff tear, you would have a lot of weakness in addition because the, the muscle and tendon would not be attached to the bone anymore and because it's not attached, it's not going to work. And so we'll, a lot of times people will go, they'll raise their hand, and then it'll just drop. Because and that's, the, the that's tendon an, has... Correct. They mapped. aren't able to hold it up. Um, additionally, there are many special tests. This is kind of the gift that physicians have with their hands, is to try and diagnose someone just by using the knowledge of anatomy and, and their hands so in, in the case where we mentioned before, in, in this case of bursitis, any situation where you can put the rotator cuff and make it impinged or, or make it squished, they should have pain if they have bursitis. Mm -hmm. 
And mm -hmm. so that's... So you're able to diagnose it through the pain. Correct. Even though you had mentioned pain sometimes travels, correct? Correct. And, and sometimes that could make it a little harder or hide other uh, factors? Sure. Um, a lot of people will complain of neck pain and it's really a problem in the shoulder or vice versa. So we could have someone coming in with shoulder pain and it's really pain uh, radiating or coming down from the neck. How then do you treat this? What what is the first step of treatment? Normally people try the first step which is rest. That's that's the key, right? Try and avoid whatever activities are causing the problem. And so by rest we don't mean bed rest, we mean relative rest. So if your arm hurts when you put it over your head, for right now don't put it over your head. <laughs> Makes sense. The old, the old Henny Youngman Don't joke. do that. Doctor, it hurts when I do that. Don't do that. <laughs> right. Um, a after that, it really depends on the case, right? Um, we mentioned ice. Um, shoulder is not an area that tends to do well with bracing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also a lot of times we tell people to elevate body parts. The shoulder doesn't respond that well to elevation. So really physical therapy is generally the best option to get this problem solved quickly and for it to not come back. And it's an interesting uh, statistic that the majority of injuries of these repetitive natures do not need surgery. A vast majority do not need surgery. Even people who have the rotator cuff tear that we talked about, not all of them need surgery. Uh, of course, there are cases that surgery is, is highly successful and recommended, but at least 90% of people do very well uh, without an operation. And, and that's a good thing because operations are expensive. Um, they can have pain. Mm -hmm. um, there's risk even with the simple ones. Um, and there's a lot of downtime. So as much as... And, and we all have to go to work the next day, right? right? So you don't right. want to get injured and not be able to go to work. The, the shoulder does not like to get injured. Mm -hmm. It's very painful. Um, recoveries can take weeks to months. Surgery recovery can take months to almost a year. So you really need patience. When, um, is there a difference between how men and women get injured in tennis and golf and the recovery? Or are they very similar injuries? Very similar injuries. What they complain about is generally different. Interesting. Um, so a, a lot of injuries uh, for shoulders can be uh, new mothers and the way they carry their infant. Um, it can be uh, complaints about the bra, which typically men don't have that going, going behind your back uh, type movement. Um, but for, for the most part, they complain about it the same way um, we get the injuries, uh, men and women get it the same. Do you um, notice a difference between what type of injuries regarding what type of sports? So golf and tennis seem to be sort of the leisurely sports, but people more aggressive sports, they get other types of repetitive injuries or are those more traumatic injuries? I would say that in, in a lot of ways I've, I've seen it all, um, even though I'm sure there's new things that will come up. <laughs> Um, anything from the newer CrossFit activities. Ah, that's a very good point. There's, there's a lot of CrossFit going on. Right. And, 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 and aggressive type of workouts. Aggressive because they're trying to motivate you to do your absolute best all the time. And, and that's a lot of pressure. Um, and sometimes you'll go beyond uh, what your shoulder is capable of doing. And that's the, by definition, what will result in damage. Yeah, if someone wanted to start that, because we have that here in Miami, these, mm -hmm. these startup CrossFits, and there's a bunch of others as well. And if people want to get into that exercise, but they want to get into shape really fast, uh, what do you recommend they do to prepare for that so they don't go out there the first day and blow out a shoulder or a knee? There's, there's a lot of home videos uh, and... Uh, facilities that offer these type of uh, advanced high high impact uh, high intense training what you want to do is seek out the instructor beforehand let them know that you're new let them know any previous injuries uh, everyone is kind of aware that CrossFit and other things like that can cause injury so can any other sport the the, the point is for you to improve yourself and a lot of that will have to do with you preparing properly and 
realizing what limitations you may have. And so there, the instructor, whether it's Pilates, yoga, um, CrossFit, Orange Theory, I mean, we can go on naming the different uh, new entities that are out there. You want to, they want to keep you as a happy person in their business. Which means keeping you healthy. Which and... means keeping you healthy. So they don't want you to get injured, but if you don't tell them you're about your pain and you don't tell them about your injury, uh, they can't help you. Um, of tennis and golf injuries, how many repeat customers do you have? Un unfortunately, some. Mm -hmm. um, there are cases that people respond and we never see them again. There's some people that uh, come in and you know they see us at the, the Miami Sports Medicine Institute. Uh, they'll maybe get therapy. Sometimes we prescribe medication. Sometimes we do injections. Uh, and it'll go away and then a year or two they'll get ambitious, they forgot the problem and it comes up again. So a lot of these things can be recurrent because the theme is the same. You, you overdid it. Um, okay. And we have to talk about post-injury and that has to do with post-injury pain and trying to reduce pain and pain management. We'll take up that discussion coming back next here on the Health Channel. Stay with right. us. T-cell therapy is a revolutionary new treatment for cancer. Healthcare companies developing CAR T immunotherapy use Thermo Fisher's DynaBeads technology to isolate, activate, and expand T-cells that have been genetically engineered to recognize and fight cancer cells. We're taking the patient's own cells and enriching those cells to fight the cancer. For more, go to thermofisher.com slash CTS. In the past 50 years, we've made a lot of progress in smoking prevention. But if we don't do more, one out of every 13 children alive today will die early from smoking. That's 5.6 million precious lives we can save. Together, we can make the next generation tobacco free. Is thinking about taking a dietary supplement. She knows she should try to get her vitamins and minerals from the food she eats, but she doesn't always have the chance to eat right. And with more than 50,000 dietary supplements on the market, like a lot of other people, Emily has questions. Like how much vitamin A is good for you and how much is too much? If something's natural, doesn't it mean it's safe? Can folic acid prevent birth defects? Should we be taking calcium and vitamin D supplements? Luckily, there's a place everyone can go for answers. It's the website of the Office of Dietary Supplements. We're part of the National Institutes of Health, and since 1995, we've been conducting, funding, and evaluating research that we use to educate the public, giving Emily plenty of information she can share and discuss with her health care providers. We're ODS for what you need to know about dietary supplements. Welcome back to the Health Channel. Check, take a look at our website 
um, allhealthallthetime.com. You could take a look at what information we're pro providing on this show as well as other shows. You could also send doctors questions for future shows that we will feature here. Uh, we're talking, of course, about sports injuries this hour. And after you're injured and as you're being treated, you're often in pain. And pain management is a hot topic these days. How do you start evaluating what type of help people need on pain, whether they need pain medication or they don't? So pain is, is, a, is a very complex thing because we talked about uh, the tendons having nerves. We talked about the bursas having nerves. Um, bones also can feel pain. And so how we interpret that pain varies by the individual. Some people have a, a higher pain tolerance and some have a lower pain tolerance. Um, some people need their shoulder for their job and, and some don't. And so we take a lot of that into account with how to deal with a person's pain. The first is to acknowledge you're injured it's going to hurt. We're very sorry, we're here to help. You're going to get better, but there may be some suffering. We should not, our goal should not be to eliminate all your pain. Okay, the pain is there for a reason to try and protect you from injuring yourself. So the days of us prescribing uh, opiates for anyone that came in with any pain is, is really not appropriate in orthopedics and sports medicine. It does happen but really more in a rare case. So most commonly, the relative rest, the ice, those things are very helpful. Over-the-counter pain medication maybe Over-the-counter pain medication. Um, there are prescription versions of anti-inflammatories. They work very well for acute or, or a pain that's pretty new. Um, they all come with side effects. So that's a risk that I discuss with my patients and let them know and it's something I would encourage you to discuss uh, with your doctor if they decide to prescribe you a medication. But we talked about physical therapy earlier. Physical therapy has different treatment modalities that you don't have access to at home. Uh, you might, but there's TENS units, there's ultrasound, uh, the massages, um, newer techniques. Some people are doing uh, dry needling. People love acupuncture. Uh, there's alternative medicines like turmeric and arnica. Um, and there's an expert there, uh, as someone who's gone through uh, physical therapy for my knee. Mm -hmm. uh, as you get older, the IT band pulls on the knee and pulls it off and you walk funny. And, and, and it and ma enormous progress made by working with an expert and using all of the tools. And people need to take advantage of that. And it's a way to reduce pain right away. It absolutely is. Not, not only is it a place to reduce pain right away, but you have an expert supervising you in your return to work, return to your sport, your hobby. You can't do it alone. We're not born with the knowledge. I wouldn't say that I'm an expert in rehabbing myself. If I were injured, I would go to rehab and have them do their, I mean, I call it magic. It's really hard work. On, on your part, the person with the pain, um, but. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, it, and it can be hard work. It can be hard work. But they so, also know where to push you and not to push you, and, and it's not it. self-help. That's it. I, you know, a lot of patients will ask, do I really need to go to physical therapy? Can't well, you, you just, wanna play golf again? Well, you can, <laughs> can you just give me a couple sheets of paper with mm -hmm. the exercise and I'll do them? Uh, I don't think that I would do them properly. Um, I know people are, all have limited budgets and limited time and sometimes going and spending two or three times a week for an hour at physical therapy is, is really not that feasible. I understand. Um, what, what I would recommend is do whatever you can, even if you can go once a week for them to kind of supervise you in your return. I, I, I want the best success for my patients. I want them to get better. And is part of that process talking to your patients about their goals post? Injury. Do you ever want to play golf again? Do you want to play tennis again? A absolutely. Without talking about the goals, um, we, won't, we won't meet your expectations. And so I would also, I also encourage the patients to, to tell their goals to the physical therapist because if you go to physical therapy, you'll see you know, um, a high school pitcher. You'll see, uh, like I said, a new mother with shoulder pain. You'll see someone with 
uh, that just had a stroke who's learning to walk again. So there's, there can be a large variation between new injuries, uh, nagging injuries, um, uh, things that are quite severe, and different physical therapists treat different problems. But if you don't give them the benefit of the doubt, letting them know what your, what your goals are. Because here in South Florida, we have a lot of older adults. Mm -hmm. They're very active. Okay, this is not a old folks home. This is where people, if they can't play tennis anymore because of their knees, they pick up pickleball. They, everyone keeps going. They pick up a different sport or a different activity. People, you know, the goal may be to walk two miles with, you know, their friends or their family. And, and staying active reduces the risk of injury in itself. Correct. Um, you know, the most medical societies recommend at least 150 minutes a week of cardiovascular exercise. So something that keeps your, your heart rate up and gets your lungs moving. And then 150 minutes a week of resistance training, which is some form of weight training. It doesn't have to be heavy weights. It doesn't have to be a gym. You, there's plenty of exercises with just your body weights that you can do at home. So those are, those are, are basically minimum requirements for, for everybody. Are you uh, and your colleagues seeing more uh, traumatic injuries in high school sports, for example, than you have in the past? Or are the coaches, managers doing a better job of managing their players to avoid those injuries? I would say that, that overall, uh, I think sports have gotten much safer. Um, I know sometimes in the media it seems like it isn't, uh, but overall, our players now coming out of high school and coming out of college, when, when I go to the NFL Combine, we, we see all the, the players from around the country, and these are, are the best that, that American football has. Um, and the injuries that they've had, and we all have them, um, they're handled much, much better. Um, previously, things that were career-ending or permanently disabling, people now recover from and return. Um, people and, it, and is that a result of not just the better treatments, but the on-the-spot decisions about what to do with that, that injured player? Part of it is um, coaches te teaching proper technique. Part of it is, is rules in place to avoid uh, things like uh, spearing or using your head to, to try and tackle somebody. Uh, I think a large part of it is also on, on our end, on the physician's end, mm -hmm. um, knowing when to not operate on somebody. And then if you do decide to operate, to make sure that the physician that you choose, the surgeon, is certified in doing that surgery. Is there uh, less pushing towards surgery these days than in the past? And is that the result of better understanding of the body and how rehabilitation might work? I, I would say that the surgery outcomes are more successful than they were in the past. Uh, the, the same injuries that were operated on in the past are typically still the ones that are operated on now. Mm -hmm. uh, just the outcomes are a little bit better. Um, the the non-operative or conservative management is um, improved because of newer techniques that are out. Um, for um, older adults who are playing tennis and golf now, but who used to be athletes um, in high school or, or amateur sports and have been injured, how does that affect their worldview now and their injuries as well, if at all? And I, I, you're smiling, so I take it you see these people. <laughs> I, I see these people, and, and I feel your pain. Um, unfortunately, I know that, that at some point I'm going to get old and have the same problems that, that they're having. Um, muscle memory is uh, a real thing. And so in your brain, you remember getting that shot in tennis. You remember running that you know, mile in that particular time you've grown used to it. You, you like doing it, you were successful at it, and with time, unfortunately, it's not going to happen, right? It, most of us aren't going to be able to play tennis at the level we played for our entire lives. And so some modifications are necessary. So specifically in tennis, uh, we recommend trying to switch to clay courts 
which in Does Florida. Play courts are better for your knees. Is that better it? for your knees? Mm -hmm. uh, we recommend switching to doubles. Uh, again, kind of limits uh, your exposure running back and forth. So you still get to play. You still get the social aspect of it, um, and you get less pain. Uh, should people be walking the golf courses instead of taking the carts? <laughs> I would obviously recommend walking the golf course. Golf is not typically a, a sport that's known for a lot of exercise uh, per se. Um, it involves a lot of coordination and skill, but certainly not uh, the cardiovascular uh, level. So any walking you do will be better than taking the cart. Um, I imagine your patients are getting older. I mean, what's your oldest patient who's still out there playing golf or tennis? Uh, I, I, I had. I think it was like three weeks ago we had three 94-year-olds in a row wow. that uh, all were active. These were not people coming in in a, a wheelchair uh, because of, uh, you know, they, they, they were very active. They played tennis. One was a tennis player, one was a golfer, and one just liked to walk with his wife. So uh, these are reasonable things, you know, when you get to retirement, you, you want to be active, you want to do the things you worked hard your whole life and now you're, you're there to relax and all of a sudden your body doesn't cooperate. And you prepare for that and yeah. you prepare for your body. Okay, when we come back, we're gonna tell you about the one tiny thing people forget while being out on the golf course or the tennis court that they should not. Stay with us on the Health Channel. T-cell therapy is a revolutionary new treatment for cancer. Healthcare companies developing CAR T immunotherapy use Thermo Fisher's DynaBeads technology to isolate, activate, and expand T-cells that have been genetically engineered to recognize and fight cancer cells. We're taking the patient's own cells and enriching those cells to fight the cancer. For more, go to thermofisher.com slash CTS. In the past 50 years, we've made a lot of progress in smoking prevention. But if we don't do more, one out of every 13 children alive today will die early from smoking. That's 5.6 million precious lives we can save. Together, we can make the next generation tobacco free. Is thinking about taking a dietary supplement. She knows she should try to get her vitamins and minerals from the food she eats, but she doesn't always have the chance to eat right. And with more than 50,000 dietary supplements on the market, like a lot of other people, Emily has questions. Like how much vitamin A is good for you and how much is too much? If something's natural, doesn't it mean it's safe? Can folic acid prevent birth defects? Should we be taking calcium and vitamin D supplements? Luckily, there's a place everyone can go for answers. It's the website of the Office of Dietary Supplements. We're part of the National Institutes of Health, and since 1995, we've been conducting, funding, and evaluating research that we use to educate the public, giving Emily plenty of information she can share and discuss with her health care providers. We're ODS for what you need to know about dietary supplements.
Welcome back to the Health Channel. We're talking about sports injuries on the golf course, on the tennis court, on any type of sports you play. Often many of these injuries are repetitive in nature, but there's one type of injury that you may not think about, and that is an injury from the sun and how to avoid getting sunburned when you're out there. And we have our um, famous burned man that we've been showing over the past couple of days, if we could put him up here and take a look. There he is. <laughs> That's his good side. <laughs> uh, and so from the Centers for Disease Control, they say that whenever you're out in the sun, you should put on a broad spectrum sunscreen with at least SPF 15 before you go outside, even on slightly cloudy or cool days. Don't forget to put a thick layer on all parts of exposed skin. Help get, uh, get help for hard to reach places like your back. And remember, sunscreen works best when combined with other options to prevent UV damage. You know, what's interesting about this doctor is when you go to the beach, you think that you need sunscreen, you get that. But sometimes you're out on the golf course, you think you're wearing clothes and they're not necessarily very helpful or fully preventive and protective. So that's, that's 100% true. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, not all clothes really protect you from the sun. And so when you look and you buy the clothes, it should say if it has some kind of UV factor, like an SPF uh, that can help prevent um, the sun rays. So just wearing a long sleeve shirt may not be enough. You may be kind of fooling I, yourself. That's probably surprises a lot of people, right? Yeah. I never think about looking at the SPF of my, of my shirts and I just want to keep my waist size down. <laughs> well, a, a lot of the newer shirts are, are very thin. They're from fabrics that do let in some of the radiation. You know, we used to wear a lot of heavy cottons when mm -hmm. we exercised. And so cotton is, is pretty good at um, preventing the sun's rays, but some of the newer fabrics aren't. And so you just need to be uh, mindful of that. And remember to wear a hat Hats. when you're out there as mm -hmm. well. Uh, vitamin D is very important. Right. And so we have a lot of um, older adults who have osteoporosis. Um, we have, uh, in general, um, a little bit less vitamin D. And so you may be checked for vitamin D with your doctor and find that you're a little low. And one of the best ways to get vitamin D is the sun. And so here's, here's, the, here's catch. the dilemma. Here's the catch. Do you put on the SPF mm -hmm. and not get the vitamin D, or do you get the direct sun exposure and then risk, you know, the, the risk of skin cancer comes out? Um, you can supplement vitamin D. So my, my advice would be for you to put the SPF on to make it part of your normal routine. Uh, this gentleman here that we have in the, in the graphic uh, obviously his forehead, around his nose, around his cheeks, he's got uh, burnt skin. The burnt skin, uh, not only is it painful for you, um, not only is it you know, a little unsightly, uh, but it also increases your risk of cancer. Anytime you burn the skin, you're causing damage to those cells, and every time you, that damage can accumulate. So the other the other thing is obviously you know wrinkles and so forth that's right. that uh, that's right. uh, a that, lot of people want younger looking skin and so getting direct sun exposure is, is not ideal for that that's right you may look good tan for a little bit but you pay the price uh, price yep. later and do you discuss that with your patients um, will you come in do patients come in sometimes and complain about a hurt shoulder and look really tan or burned and you say you know you have other another problem here. <laughs> uh, generally, I have this discussion more with teams that I take care of or uh, when I'm teaching other physicians that take care of teams to not forget about the environment. So we talk about the sun. Uh, also in South Florida, we talk a lot about the heat with hydration, monitoring the temperature. You know, there's, there's unfortunate uh, deaths from, from heat that are 100% preventable. Mm -hmm. uh, in many cases, uh, skin cancers are preventable. And, and talk about heat, bring water with you. Absolutely. Drink lots of water. Lots Let, of water. Let's talk about your work with the uh, Miami Dolphins for a moment uh, because it's kind of an interesting topic. Uh, what kind of injuries are football players getting these days? And, and what amazes me, by the way, is how quickly professional athletes recover from these injuries. I mean, they get all sorts of injuries and they're back on the field the next week. So, I would say that professional athletes are very similar um, in my practice to how um, other manual labor type jobs work. 
everyone has uh, a job to do, uh -huh. um, and our first job is, is uh, as a physician uh, for the team is to decide, are you safe to continue or not? Um, assuming that, let's say, they're not safe, our job is to get them back as quick as possible. And so that's true for the professional athlete, like for the Miami Dolphins, and it's also true for anyone that comes into my office because we want you to return back safely and quickly. That's the specialty that, that we deal with at the Miami Orthopedics and Sports Medicine Institute. So in football, it's a lot of collisions. In many cases, those guys go through like a car crash type impact. That's interesting. It's a car crash. It's, it's that they're big, they're strong, they're fast. They're moving dip in the same direction at, the, at um, high speeds. The reason that they are able to sustain that level is because they practice, they practice, they train, they practice. Professional teams have an entire strength and conditioning department that are devoted to keeping these guys strong. There's an entire athletic training department. Athletic trainers are phenomenal mm -hmm. at treating athletes, recognizing when the first sign of injury happens, and then treatments, 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 limiting their, their exposure, their, their repetitions, uh, to avoid them missing time, right? Everyone wants to win the game. Everyone wants to play well. And so that requires a huge team approach. So the team doctors are really, for the most part, a, a break in case of emergency, right? The, the team has its own staff that takes care of a vast majority of the problems to keep the team functioning well. How do you advise players for their lives 20 years after they've stopped playing when in, they're experiencing injuries now, what they can do so they're not Joe Namath who had both knees replaced, I understand. So, uh, some of it you may be able to predict um, because if you've had a significant injury, you're at an increased chance of getting something like knee arthritis. Um, some things are genetic and can't be changed. One of the biggest things, uh, because there, there was a recent study that came out showing that uh, NFL players, when they uh, retire, are actually healthier than a matched group of people that didn't play. Uh, so I do think we are doing a good that, job in that regard. That makes sense a little bit and, and, and shows improvements. Right. Um, the biggest thing is really the weight gain. Um, when they're with the team, the diet is well controlled. They're exercising almost year round regularly. When they retire, that's not always the case. And I think we've seen a lot of athletes sometimes gain the weight. Um, that weight gain is very, very detrimental to your overall health and your bones and joints. So my best advice uh, is to, to try and stay lean if you can. And for the amateur athlete as well, uh, weight gain may impact how you're, you physically operate. Could be differently than three months earlier, right? If you take, let's say, the summer off from playing golf and you come down here in the winter. If, and you weigh 20 pounds more. Right. If, if you pack on that Thanksgiving, Christmas type <laughs> weight, yeah. um, you're going to feel it in your knees, 100%. There's no way around it. Uh, that's a conversation I have with every patient that comes in with uh, ankle, knee, hip pain. Um, it, it needs to be had. Um, they need to know that weight is the, the major part of the load on the knees. And when you bend your knees, uh, with a squat or with stairs, your body weight it actually gets multiplied with the way the physics work. So it can be five to seven times your body weight. So just gaining 10 pounds, which is a lot, but gaining 10 pounds can be, you know, 50 to 70 pounds extra on your knee for every step. That's an amazing, amazing number to think about because right. you don't think about that at all. Uh, that and and you end up walking poorly and hurting your knees even more. Conversely, someone who's overweight, mm -hmm. you don't need to slash 100 pounds. You don't need to think that high. Even just a small change will result in an improvement in your pain. Okay, so to, for the takeaway here, mm -hmm. if you start feeling pain in, so, in something you're doing, consider seeing a doctor. That's listen, usually an indication. Listen to your body. 
Uh, your body's going to tell you when something's wrong. Don't ignore it. Don't think that just because you've done it in the past, you'll get away with it because that will only take you so far. Um, we're here available to you. Um, I'm happy to answer questions if you send them in to the Health Channel. Uh, and we can try and respond and, and help you along your way. And also, you can get people back out there quicker if they come in and say that they need help. The, the longer you go injured, the longer you're going to be on the sidelines. People will come in with pain for a year and, and hope they can get better in two weeks. That's simply not, not likely to happen, unfortunately. It will usually take us at least as long as you've had the injury to recover. So the sooner you come in, the sooner we can correct the problem, the sooner you can get back to doing what you love doing. All right, doctor, and get out there and exercise, though. Absolutely. Don't let that stop you. Don't, that's the best thing for you. Okay. Even if you do have a small risk of injury, uh, you're better off exercising than not. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for having me, Andrew. I want to remind everybody to take a look at our website at allhealthallthetime. Uh, com. There you'll find information about this show and other shows. You could also send in questions to our doctors who will answer them on future shows. I'm Andrew Schmertz. Thanks for watching. Thank See you, you next time.